Well, good morning. My name is John Allen. Welcome to Risen Church. So, we have a couple of uh, exciting things happening today. So, it's a little bit of an out-of-the-ordinary kind of morning or, or day this Sunday. So, uh, we've got a number of things happening in the life of our church. So, first of all, we're going to be launching, starting today, we're launching multiple new community groups. Yeah, that's great. So um, we're excited about that. So as, as uh, Rich mentioned earlier, we're going to have a community group fair, uh, which will be in the tables in the back. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, and we're going to invite uh, people up. We're going to actually the primary leaders of each one of the community groups. We're going to invite them to come forward and we're going to provide some time even after the service for you to get to know them, to get to know their community group, what it's about, and uh, even to get to know some of their co-leaders. So we've got the primary leaders, we've got the co-leaders, we've got hosts. It's a bunch of people um, just to, to get to know. Uh, and I also want to say this, though. If you are new, or if it's your like first, second, third time, then first and foremost, we're really glad that you are here. Um, I want you to feel welcome, and I want you to feel welcome and invited to come and join or, or check out these community groups. But by signing up, you're not like signing your life away, or you're like, this is my first time, guys. Like, I'm just trying to check things out. That's okay. Um, in fact, again, we're very glad that you're here, and I don't want you to feel that pressure. Uh, but I do want you to feel a very uh, open armed embrace, like a welcome. So I want you to know that you are invited. And so uh, please know that. And also, if you are new, then uh, I want to encourage, uh, you'll see on our website, we have something called Try Five. Now, that's because uh, it means try five, like try five weeks, consecutive weeks, just to kind of get to know who we are, what we're about. Uh, and the reality is, is that Risen Church is not about one speaker or a worship leader or any one event even. And so it often takes sort of five consecutive times to get to know the different dynamics and who we are and what we're about. And by the way, spoiler alert, what we are about is Jesus. So we're not about any one human other than the God-man, Jesus Christ himself. And so this is the power of even when we're worshiping, um, we, you know, you, you may not know this or not, but you are actually a part of the choir. The moment you stepped in here, it's not just like this is where the worship is all happening and you've got the worship team leading the music here and then you guys are just the audience listening. The reality is, is that this team is facilitating worship unto the Lord, that he is the audience. You are actually a part of the choir. And so this is the power of when we're singing together and it is a sweet aroma unto the Lord. And so there's a lot of um, opportunities to partner together in that as we uh, sort of, in, 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 we receive our invitation into the spiritual throne room of heaven. And that's what we're doing when we're singing together and we're praying together and we're gathering around God's word together as his church. And so um, this is part of the, the power and talk a little bit more about this as we go. Uh, I also, if you are new, I want to invite you to lean into also the Weekender, which is happening October 13th and 14th. And this is sort of our model for membership. It's how you can learn about what it even looks like to join the church in an official capacity. And that's happening October 13th and 14th, which is a Friday uh, evening, and then we'll come back again on Saturday morning and just learn about the history and values of the church. We'll learn more about that later, but um, that's, so all of that is a way of sort of on-ramping into community and community groups. We've got a lot of opportunities for you in that, but um, we've got one more thing, and then we're going to dive into uh, sort of our like brief sermon here for you this morning. Um, this afternoon, say 3 p.m. Oh, come on. 3 p.m. There we go. We're going to be meeting on 64th Street to baptize multiple people in the Atlantic. That's great. So um, we love to celebrate baptism uh, because as much as we love community groups, baptism is like a picture of being immersed into the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit and his people. Right? It's a picture of being, as the church, we are the body of Christ. We are the hands and feet and the, the tone and expression on his face and, and all of these things. We are the embrace to one another of the very arms of Christ. It doesn't mean we're perfect like Christ, but it does mean that we're perfectly loved by Christ and we can point one another to his perfect love. And when we fall short of that, we then demonstrate 
and ask for and receive grace from one another in that process as we grow and become more and more like him. Um, but the power of baptism is uh, a picture of being um, baptized or immersed into his death and his resurrection. And so uh, you'll see when we go out there, 64th Street again at 3 p.m., um, the people being baptized will have a shirt like this, say, Jesus in my place. It's a picture of the gospel itself, right? And so uh, again, we have a lot to celebrate and be thankful for today, um, and so I don't want to just gloss over these two foundational aspects of who we are as his church and, and the why behind the what, or I should say the who behind the what, which is all designed to point to Jesus. It's not just ritual. It's not just religious motions that we go through or, or, or uh, things that we do in order to check a box. Everything we do is designed to point us to Jesus and to grow deeper in that relationship with him. So um, we talked a lot about uh, last week the significance of communion. Um, and this is uh, this week we're, again, launching our community groups. We're celebrating baptism. And again, we'll also be taking communion together. So it all has deep significance. Um, and, and it's intentional. But again, the power is in connecting with the meaning and more importantly, the one that it all points to, which is Jesus Christ. So just by coming and participating in something doesn't mean, because you just because you get baptized or just because you get wet, that doesn't mean anything. We want to know the significance. This is an outward proclamation of an inward faith because baptism doesn't save you. Amen? Right? Faith alone, in Christ alone, and the grace alone that you receive as a result of that, that is what saves us, right? It's by grace alone, in fi sorry, by grace through faith alone in Christ alone. That is what saves us. But that uh, baptism is that outer declaration or proclamation of the inward faith. And so um, all of this is pointing to who Jesus is and who we are as a uh, community, a gospel community community, which is really the title of the sermon this morning, which will be brief so we can get into the community group uh, fair. Um, so before I invite our group, uh, yeah, group leaders to come up, um, I do want to briefly walk through Acts 2, verse 41 through 47, and I want to connect who we are and what we're doing today with the ancient foundations of the church that have been taking place for almost 2,000 years. It's not insignificant. It's all very intentional. I want, us to, I want you to see how and why. So uh, as a church, um, this summer we've just finished reading through the Gospels, which are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So if you open up your Bible, you'll see that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament. And the uh, New Testament, essentially, it, is, it starts with Matthew. You get Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they are... Uh, it, essentially the summary or description of the birth, life, um, death, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus Christ. That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about. In fact, you get essentially four different perspectives on that life. They don't contradict each other, but they do give us a fuller understanding from sort of different angles. That's what Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are about. So stick with me, because I'm going to give you a basic summary of the entire Bible this morning, all right? Um, so this is the uh, the power of these books. And so we see in this that he is the fulfillment of everything that every book in the Bible has been pointing to previously. So you got the New Testament, but you got the Old Testament. And so when you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, what you're seeing is that all of the things that the Old Testament was talking about essentially point us to Jesus. And so it begins by saying, okay, you get this, the, the Old Testament is essentially God saying, okay, guys, you are sinful, you jacked up everything, and so I'm going to show you that you're sick and that you need a Savior. That's what the Old Testament's about. So you use laws, and it says, look, look, in order for you to be restored and redeemed, you have to live like this, because God is holy. You've fallen out of relationship with me through sin, and in order to be restored with me, you have to be holy like me. And that means all of these laws have to be taken, uh, not taken for granted, but you need to take them, receive them, live up to them. And so the Old Testament is essentially God's people going, we can't. 
We're trying and we're falling flat on our face every time. And so he then says, you are so sinful. You need a sacrifice to take the penalty of your inability to live up to what I've called you to live up to. And that sacrifice was a lamb, a blood sacrifice, and it pointed them forward to who Jesus would be. Right? And so the cross is where the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, died in our place. So everything in the Old Testament is actually looking forward to what Jesus would do at the cross. And so we now look back to the cross, essentially recognizing that Jesus is enough for us. And so he took our place and that he was um, sufficient. And so everything in the New Testament put back to Jesus and then forward to his return, but it's all about the cross. So Old Testament looks forward to the cross, New Testament looks back to the cross, cross is the center of eternity. It's all about Jesus. And so um, that's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The very next book that you're going to see in the New Testament after John is a New Testament book called Acts. All right, you guys with me? You guys got your coffee? You guys tracking? Look, I got a brief moment here. So this is going to be one of those fire hydrant moments, all right? So we can get the community group leaders up. So you got to lean in, and we're going to make this happen, okay? So the very next book, again, in the New Testament that you're going to see is a book called Acts. It's written by the same guy who wrote the book of Luke, and he records the actions of the early church just after Jesus ascends into heaven. So if you want to know what happened after Jesus came and... Right after the cross, he's resurrected, and he ascends into heaven, and he tells the disciples, hey, you don't have what it takes. He's like, look, I have died for your sins. This is the good news. Now go to the nations, not just to the Jews, not just to the people that you know and are friendly with, but go to the nations, the lost people of the world even, and make disciples who then make disciples. That's his command. But he says, wait a minute. You don't have what it takes to do this. You try to do this in your own strength, you're going to fall flat on your face. Just like trying to be good enough and leaving up to the law. And so he says, wait. Because I'm going to come to you. I'm going to send even the Holy Spirit. All right? And so they wait 50 days. In Acts 1, the disciples now, 50 days later, the disciples are all gathered in this room and they're petrified about the future. That Jesus has, has commanded them to take the good news of his resurrection to the nations, but he's told them to wait for his spirit. So they're confused, they're expectant, they're probably just trying to keep it together in this kind of huddled together in this upper room. And then suddenly, the spirit of God fills this room and fills them for the very first time. And so they're filled with boldness and with worship. And they begin praising God so loudly and so boldly that the people outside of the room hear it. And they hear them speaking even in their own language. They're talking about the goodness of God and the kingdom of God. And they're talking about who Jesus is. And they're, they're talking about essentially the gospel and these languages, the disciples, they couldn't even have known. And these people are hearing them in their own languages and they're like, what is happening? In other words, the cultural and even linguistic barriers were not even barriers for the gospel or the good news of Christ to grow the church. God was now doing things that was beyond their capacity in order for the kingdom to grow. It was beyond their strength. It was beyond their capacity. The Spirit of God did it. But he did it through people who were faithful and willing. And so people then hear them, and, and I, I love this because if you read Acts 2, they, they think they're just kind of crazy or at least drunk. <laughs> it actually says they think they're drunk, right? And, and then Peter stands up, and this is one of my favorite scenes because if you know your Bible, Peter is the guy that 50 days previous to this, just 50 days ago, this guy so cowardly that he denies knowing Jesus to a 12-year-old girl. Big 
fisherman Peter, who's like cutting people's ears off and ready to throw down, suddenly, on the night Jesus is crucified, the guy who's like, I'll never deny you, gets punked down by a 12-year-old. Okay? That was Peter. Now, 50 days later, he gets filled with the Spirit of God. And in the same city in Jerusalem, he steps up, stands up, and addresses a crowd of thousands of people who are basically like, who are all these crazy drunk people? And he speaks with boldness and clarity, and he ties the Old Testament in with who Jesus was, and he says, this is the guy you've been waiting for, the one you crucified, pretty confrontational, has risen from the grave. And his spirit now has descended upon us and fills us up. And then he calls each one of them to place their faith in Christ and what he did at the cross. And he calls them to be baptized. Which was a symbol of repentance, a turning from sin and towards God and being immersed into his life, death, and resurrection. That's the context of Acts 2, verse 41. And so now verse 41 picks up here saying this. Acts 2, verse 41. So those who received his word, that's key, they had to receive what he was saying. You've got to receive the good news. They were baptized. And there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Now think about that. 3,000 people. This isn't like a handful of people. 3,000 people received Christ and were baptized. Now, that's a logistic nightmare, <laughs> right? I, now, you know what? If 3,000 people are like, hey, let's get, we want to receive Christ today, let's go, right? We're going to need some help, though, right? Like, this is a serious, serious uh, problem and also opportunity, praise God, right? But this is, I want you to get the image of what's happening on this day. This is the birth of the church. And then verse 42, it says, so after they were baptized, it's the beginning of the church, and then it describes what follows this way. Verse 42, and they devoted, say devoted. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, this doesn't just mean that they ate snacks together. <laughs> breaking of bread is what you would do with your friends. You wouldn't break bread with enemies. These are people that you were reconciled with and in relationship with. There's power, especially in that culture surrounding the breaking of bread. And they're praying together. And then verse 43, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and, all, and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. I love that. They weren't just like persecuted and being like, oh, who are these crazy Christians? They're nuts. In this context, the birth of the church was one of having favor with all the people. It's interesting. Now, later there was a lot of persecution, but it's interesting that it was born with favor. To be a Christian doesn't necessarily mean that everyone hates you, okay? If you stand up for that which is the Lord, sometimes that does happen, but it doesn't have to be either or, always, okay? That was a nugget. Final sentence here. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Which means on top of that initial 3,000 people, Every day, God was saving souls. Not just numbers, souls, people. And so, the first thing that I want you to see here, our first point here, and we're going to roll through this, is that the Spirit was poured out and moved in power when the disciples were gathered together. That's significant. Notice that. The, sport, the Spirit was poured out and moved in power when the disciples were gathered together. 
And so, like, yes, Peter was a point person, for sure. There was a leader. There was, there's, it's very clear that, that he does step up, and he kind of becomes a point of contact in many ways. However, don't lose sight of the fact that every single person participated. Every one of the disciples participated in that witness. There was a partnership. Like, they all played a part. And as the church grows structurally, we even see that that becomes even more apparent as they begin assigning different spirit-filled leaders to help care for people in the church. In fact, Acts 6, not long after this, chapter 6 of, of the book of Acts tells us that as the church grew, some widows were being neglected. And so at the logistics, they were unintentionally being overlooked, and that's not a good thing, but as things grow, logistics happen, and all the stuff takes place, and you need help. Things need to get some structure around it, right? And so um, the apostles, which means the sent ones, they kind of pull everyone together, and they say this in Acts 6. This is part of verse 2, the back part. It says this. They say, it's not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore... Brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the Spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And so they choose seven leaders to serve. And then verse 6 says, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith, which I love that. So you know what happens when the priests, you know why the priests are coming to the faith? I love that little nugget right there, by the way. Let's think about that. If the priests are coming to be, are becoming obedient to the faith, the priests were the ones that had their minds and hearts soaked in the word of God. And so they're like, oh, this is all talking about Jesus. We're in. It's powerful. And so people aren't just getting baptized and continuing on with life as usual. This would have been an upending of things. Like they're getting baptized, but they're being pointed to Jesus through gospel community, and they're being embraced into gospel community as they then build gospel community. The gospel community isn't just the thing that does the witnessing, and it's like, have fun, right? It's what you're immersed into. The church isn't just a place that you go or an event that we attend. It's a people we belong with. It's a people we partner with. It's something that goes beyond just the religious check that we, or the, the religious box that we check. It always has been. So baptism is, again, that public proclamation of your inner faith. And it's saying, hey, I'm in. Now, there, is, there are places where people are baptized, and there's no church. <laughs> we see this with the Ethiopian eunuch. Philip baptizes an Ethiopian man, and then he's like, I don't have a church, but you know what? We know that he then went down and started a church, right? That's what he did. He didn't just isolate, and we see the same thing in Colossae. In fact, the guy who planted the church in, in the, the, you know, the letter Colossians, the church in Colossae, it was one dude who hears the gospel and he's like, whoa, he goes home, he makes a bunch of disciples and he plants a church. Pretty awesome. And so where there is no church, instead of just throwing up their hands in despair and isolation, they lead others to Christ and they plant a church. And so again, this isn't about isolation, it's about commission. So the church has always been an immersion into this commissioned community with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It always has been. So what we see is that this early church, they're meeting together regularly. They're meeting in the temple. They would gather together at the very least each Sunday in Solomon's portico, which was like the porch of the temple, which is a huge porch. This is where they, the early church tended to gather. And so they would soak in the word of God all together. And then they would break bread later on in their homes in smaller groups. You see? And what would happen is we, um, there's this community that's established. And there's a community on mission that's established, which is why I like the word co-mission. This is our great commission. And so 
that church wasn't just an event that they attended. It was a people that they belonged with and partnered together on mission with, which is actually our second point. I've driven that one home pretty good already. <laughs> but the church isn't just an event we attend. It's a people we belong with and partner with in the Great Commission. Now, listen, this is important. You are likely a part of many different communities in our city. You may be a part of a community at work. You may be a part of maybe even an elite military team or something like that, and that has its own little community, a part of it. Maybe you're a CrossFitter, or maybe your kids are on a baseball team. Our, our, our son has a baseball uh, team that's kind of like, it has its own little community in it, and I love it. It's great, and you should invest in those people and love those people, but there is no community like gospel community. It's different, guys. It's a different kind of thing. Because it's not community for the sake of baseball. It's not community for the sake of community or fitness or whatever your goal at work might be. It's community for the sake of the king of glory. It's community for the sake of his great commission to make disciples who make disciples. It's not community for the sake of your own health and welfare. Now, that's a byproduct for sure. The healthiest thing for you to do, the healthiest thing for your soul is to be invested in gospel community. Amen? But don't get it twisted. Because the moment you get that twisted is the moment you start feeling entitled to certain ways that people should treat you. And you start getting selfish. And then things start getting divisive. Ask me how I know. Don't really ask me. You don't want to know. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. No, no. But this is, when that happens, when that happens, praise God, it's an opportunity to extend grace and receive grace and therefore proclaim grace to the world around us. Amen? This is what the church does. This is who we are. But you can't do that if you're isolated from community. This is the power of it. And so, I, again, we're gathering together on the Lord's Day, which is a big part of it, um, Sunday, the Lord's Day, which is the day he resurrected, but that's not the only part. In fact, a lot of what we do in community groups is connecting our week to the weekend, and that's part of what we do when we're gathering. So a typical community group will look like this. You gather together around 6 p.m., you eat, you break bread together, people are bringing food, you're hanging out, you're getting to know each other, you're saying, how was your week? You're connecting with people. If there's new people, you're embracing them in, right? Right? Um, and there's the discussion may kick off around 6.30, and we'll connect the weekend to the week. We'll connect the week to the weekend. You discuss the scripture that was preached on. You discuss the sermon through this sermon-guided discussion, and, and then applying it to your lives. And then break up for the last little portion, men with men, women with women, and pray. It may be prayer requests born of the discussion that you just had, or it might be that, hey, you know, um, I'm getting surgery soon. Can you please pray for me? Right? These types of things. And there's also a way where you can know, hey, like, this is how we can love on each other. Or, or you know, I'm not going to be around because um, there's a funeral happening and someone, I'm grieving. And then you can take time and pray for each other and be Jesus to each other. Or at least be a conduit of his love to one another. Nobody in here is Jesus. Don't twist that. You get an email on that one. <laughs> but this is the point, right? Like, hear this. If you think of Christianity as a group of people who think they're better than everyone else or morally superior, first of all, that's not Christianity, okay? If you think of people as being trying to be better than everyone else or more knowledgeable, then this kind of group is going to be really intimidating, right? If that's how you perceive Christianity, which is how the world often presents the church, whether it's true or not, if that's how you view it, then you're going to be sitting in your car before you go into community group trying to memorize the books of the Bible in case someone asks you to turn to a particular chapter because you don't want to look foolish. Or you're going to try and get some fresh revelation so you can be impressive, does that make sense? Like there's this all of these things, or, or you maybe you'll just show up and try again to be to impress people with how much you know, or you'll be afraid that people will find out how much you don't know. Or worse yet, that you're not perfect. Or just how imperfect you are. But guys, the thing that unites Christians is that we've acknowledged our need for his grace. Not that we are awesome, but that he is. Not that we're perfect, but that we're perfectly loved. 
Now, there's nothing wrong with fresh love, revelation, right? Like, you learn something about it, and you're like, you go into your community group, and you want everybody to know it. Praise God. It's beautiful. But it's about him, not us. Because the entire point of gospel community is that we've come to grips with both our need for a Savior and the goodness and total sufficiency of Jesus Christ for us. That he is enough. His grace is enough even when we aren't. And so these community groups are spaces and places where we can come and be honest with each other. Which is part of why even those prayer request times where it's just men with men and women with women are very helpful. And so you don't have to share beyond what you want or anything like that. I'm not saying you got to pull it all out. And sometimes you just come together and you just magnify the, who Jesus is. And you're like, did you read this in here? That's amazing. Yes, that's great. Beautiful. But sometimes you need to connect with each other and say, look, I'm struggling here. And it's like, yeah, that's great. This is part of what community in Christ is about. And we're going to remind you of who he is. Because this is the gospel. That this is, and it's the reminder of this good news. We never graduate from the gospel. It's simply this, that God became a man. The creator of the universe became a man, and he lived the life that we couldn't live. And he died the death we deserve to die. And he conquered death and the grave. He conquered the thing that all of our sin deserved. Like all of humanity stands condemned before God because of sin. Everybody. And Jesus himself took the weight of what we all deserved at the cross. And then he conquered death and the grave. He conquered the penalty itself through the resurrection. And he paved the way to eternal life with the creator of the universe, with God Almighty, restoring fellowship with God and humanity through that resurrection. And it's an eternal life, guys, that doesn't just start one day when we die. It's not like we're all just sitting here going, man, one day it's going to be awesome, but for now, meh. In some sense, yes, that's true. We see in part now. Right? One day we'll see in full. However, the reality is that through the Holy Spirit, the bridge has been gapped. And spiritually, there is access to his presence now. Now. Not just one day when we die. In fact, if you're waiting for that, then your life is, it's like ignoring a buffet in front of you when you're starving. And so God is saying the moment you place your faith and your hope in what Christ has done for you at the cross and through the resurrection, you can receive this relationship with him that begins now. And when we enter together and gather in gospel community, we remind one another of that reality, whether we're feeling it in that moment or not. What is true, he loves you. He's enough for you. He's near. He sees you. That's gospel community. It's a safe place and a safe space to confess issues that, aren't, that don't define you. You need people to hear that you're struggling so they can remind you that that's not who you are. That who you are is who you are in Christ and who he's called you to be. This is confession and repentance and then being encouraged to walk in belief. It's not shame, right? It's simply reality that says, hey, that shame, all that stuff, it's gone. You're not labeled and bound there. Now, if you are in a state in which you're saying, no, this is who I am, this sin is what I want, and I want it more than God, then nobody can do anything with that, right? That's why confession means you're confessing what's true and what's real. I'm confessing that this sin has captivated me and I don't want it. I'm confessing that I do what I don't want to do and I don't do the things that I do want to do. Oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of sin and death? I'm quoting the Apostle Paul right now in Romans 7. And then you've got gospel community that comes around and says you're not bound by that. That's not who you are. Who you are is in Christ. And Romans 8 says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And we come around one another and we pray for one another and we link arms and we say, walk this way. This is the way of Jesus. 
gospel community. And it's beautiful. And it's a demonstration of grace. And it's a proclamation of who he is. And it's a redirection of our vision, our paradigm, our worldview to view Jesus for who he is. That is literally what repentance means. And we walk in this belief together. And we just marvel in who he is. And remember, so many ways we're still in the process. Because community group, guys, is where we're reminded that our scars aren't just places where we've been wounded. They're places where God has healed us. It's where he's restored us. And it's where he's formed and transformed us. I'm going to say that one again. Community group, gospel community, is where we're reminded that your, scar, your scars, be them physical or spiritual, those scars aren't just places where you've been wounded. They're places where God has healed you. And it may be places where God is healing you. We're, often we're in the process. We just sang the song, Broken Vessels. Love that song. And, and here are the lyrics. Some of the lyrics say this. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole. You should think about in the form of not just your own life that's broken and scattered, but in this room, as Jesus sees his church, he sees a people. He sees multiple pieces in here. And it can feel like you're scattered and disconnected. And he's saying, I want to gather you together. All these pieces, broken and scattered, in mercy gathered, mended and whole. Empty-handed, but not forsaken. I've been set free. I've been set free. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Oh, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. I'm going to close with this illustration here. And we're wrapping it up. But the, the, there's a Japanese um, process called uh, kintsugi. Anybody heard of this? Oh, man, it's great. It's an ancient Japanese process for taking broken vessels, pottery, for example, that's fallen off of a shelf or whatever, and they would take that pottery and they would begin to mend the pieces together with glue, but it was golden glue. It was infused with gold, and as a result of the scars, you would see, if you've ever seen pottery, you've broken a mug or something, you try and like super glue that thing back together, it's kind of like, meh, it works. But it's still kind of like, every time you look at it, you're like, it's kind of, jacked up, right? Yeah, somebody's got a favorite mug that they're like, man. But what happened with kintsugi is what they would do is they would infuse gold into the glue and they would put it, piece it back together. And what has taken place now is that formerly worthless pottery has now, and the value is exponentially increased. That after what was broken, you see it, and it's beautiful. You see it in the, uh, this, is, this is an example of kintsugi. And so what will happen is that that that, that former piece of pottery that was worthless is now extremely valuable. This is what Jesus does. He doesn't just put us back together as a, as a sort of like shorthanded form of what we once were after our struggle or issue. He recreates you into something totally new and even more valuable. And your life is restored. This, there's a strength there's a resilience, more resilience, more valuable. This is what our life is when we come to Jesus together and on an individual basis. And he restores us and puts us back together better than we were. And this is the process that we walk through together in community. And we need one another to remind us of these things. And so, uh, and, and I'm going to close the final point here is that gospel community isn't just something we find, it's something we build. So this is last but not least, guys. I want you to get this. Gospel community is not just something that you find, it's something you build. So with these community groups, what I'm, what, I want to I caution you with choosing the community group that you think is going to be most comfortable for you. Now, that might be a great thing. There's nothing wrong with running with people who are, are like you and, and this is comfortable to you, but it may be that God is asking you to step out of your comfort zone 
Because that's where he produces something deeper. That's where he says, hey, look, you're not just here to fit in. God has commissioned you to build. We don't just fit into an already established community. We, fit, we lean into this commission to build community. And this keeps us in check with what his mission is. And it takes our eyes off of ourselves and it helps us to focus on what matters to Jesus and to see one another as he is piecing us together as this great kintsugi process of our local church and community. And he fits us together by grace and we partner together on mission. Again, it's not just community, it's a commissional community. And it's a powerful opportunity for us to bring glory to him. He has done this. This is how his church has grown for thousands of years. And so as we kind of close now, I want to invite our leaders up. So uh, why don't you give our community group leaders a hand as they come forward.